ready to go? Okay. All right, I think we are ready to begin. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome you all to the Dixon Room for what is the one of the last sessions in the uh, Bad Sydney Crime Festival. And I just want to let you know before we start that they will probably get a warning just before five o'clock that the library is going to close, right? Don't panic. Chris will still be walking over into the central library and still be signing books and we will probably be knocking around till about 5 30. so don't feel you're going to be locked out there is no need to to worry on that score okay um i would like to begin by acknowledging the gadigal people of the aora nation as the traditional owners of this land and to pay our respect to their elders past present and emerging and if you haven't seen the wonderful Gamay exhibition up on the um, first floor of the library, do go. It's just an extraordinary um, exhibition that deals with the first sighting of the first fleet coming in from the indigenous point of view. It's quite extraordinary, very moving. Um, my name is Sue Turnbull, if I haven't already said that. And these days I introduce myself as um, by day, I'm a professor of communication and media at the University of Wollongong, and by night, I'm a crime fiction reviewer, um, and I'm a member of Sisters in Crime Australia, and um, I do my crimey things um, under the cover of darkness. But here I am on a Sunday afternoon at the State Library, so I'm out in the open, and I'm very happy to be so. And I'm absolutely delighted to be interviewing Chris Hammer about his books. And I was just telling him I have quite deliberately not read some of his interviews because I wanted to come to this interview completely fresh. But just before we do that, I realized that I have got to do those housekeeping things. Now, is there anybody for whom this is their first session in the festival? Oh, okay, all right. Well, just about everybody in this room can tell you what the protocols now are. We're practicing COVID distancing. There is hand sanitizer at the entrance. Uh, please mute your phones um, if you wish to hashtag uh, Bad Crime Sydney or at Bad Crime Sydney, please do so and join in the conversation there. If you're watching on Zoom and welcome to all our Zoom viewers, um, there will be time for questions at the end. We'll be opening that to the floor. And if you want to ask a question, please use the Q&A function. And I'll be letting you, um, alerting you to that about 20 minutes from the end to remind you. So if you've got a question, just keep it front of mind. Okay, I think that's the, the business end done. So um, actually, I'm going to do something a little bit the other way around. I'm just going to get you warmed up. Um, I want you to give a little clap for Chris for coming along. Yay! Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Chris, I said I was going to begin at the beginning, and I am. Because I was in a session yesterday where you were talking about being a kind of, I don't know, ADHD sort of person, you know, <laughs> of being a bit scatty and all the rest of it. And I wanted no, to go... just lazy. <laughs> Or lazy and I wanted to go back so where were you born what kind of a kid were you and the most important question you can ask a crime writer what were you reading okay I was born in Tasmania uh, but I grew up in Canberra I'm the youngest of three kids and that's important because my elder brother and my elder sister uh, were reading books and so as a kid I really wanted to be able to read too because they, they'd sort of go off and they'd be lost to me. They would, wouldn't want to play with me because they were reading. So I wanted to read too. And I, I guess I was quite precocious. I learned to read quite quickly, I think, because I just wanted to do it so much. Um, so I pretty much missed a lot of uh, picture books. So pretty moved straight into chapter books, despite the fact that, you know, there were lots of words I, I didn't really understand. I, I sort of skip over or imagine whatever. Um, I can remember reading um, The Wind in the Willows and Blinky Bill and books like that. So this is when I was about maybe six or so. The first book that really captured my imagination was... Um, uh, King Arthur, a sort of a condensed version of um, the Arthurian legends. 
um, which really captured my imagination for some reason. And you know, it starts off. There's, 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 you know, there's, there's the, you know, the the sword and the stone, and the, you know, Arthur is fate, you know, fated to be king. And then you get all these adventures of different knights. It's all very daring do. And then, of course, it has this. It does not have a happy ending. You know, he gets basically. You know, there's a coup led by his bastard son. He gets killed. His best mate runs off with his missus. There's all sorts of and you know it wasn't Disneyland, right? And it's all like, oh, this is a... so. That, so I look. I don't know why that was the that was a book that really captured my imagination. I think at that really young age, and then you know, I just kept reading for the rest of my life. So Arthurian noir. We have just discovered a whole new genre of preparation for a crime writer. Did you think about being a writer at that time? You know, I always had a bit of a creative urge. I always liked, I wouldn't say an artistic urge so much as just I liked making things. Um, and whenever I, you know, got my hands on something, the idea of actually making something. So, for example, when I was a teenager, I got a guitar and pretty much as soon as I could have three or four chords, I started writing songs and just assumed that's what everybody did. And then later I'd, I'd meet people who were just spectacularly good musicians, as in, you know, a great deal of virtuosity on their instruments, but they didn't write songs and it came as a, like an enormous sort of surprise to me. Now, I'm not actually a very good musician and my songs are lousy, but it was just, I guess, that impulse, I'd be nice to make stuff. So I do remember I, was, I wasn't a reclusive kid. Um, I was very good at sport, so I spent a lot of time um, playing sport. But I remember um, at, at one point, you know, 10, 11, 12, I became quite obsessed with cricket and I used to watch it on the telly and, that, and I started writing my own cricket magazines and stuff and stuff like that. So that was, that was more of a journalistic impulse, I guess, than a, than a fiction impulse. Well, that, that does take us up to journalism because that was, you went to Charles Sturt University, which I now discovered Michael Brissenden went to Charles Sturt. No, well, I he, he went to would... Belmont Art School. <laughs> he went to where? He went to art school to do ceramics. Ah, oh, okay. I've been misinformed about that, but there's quite a few. No, no, Michael and I went to the same school in Canberra, oh. um, which was very progressive. Um, in the late 70s uh, when Canberra was ruled by the federal government and the Whitlam government had brought in this educational re revolution. So I was able to, at in my last two years at school, do uh, photography, uh, filmmaking, music, um, a whole lot of creative stuff like that, as well as more traditional subjects like literature and chemistry and mathematics or whatever, yeah. But you're describing a, a drift towards journalism because all those filmmaking, you know, writing, creative writing, those photography, those are all things that would feed into a journalism degree. So did you go straight into journalism at that point? No, I um, I had a, I had what's now known as a gap year, except it was actually three gap years. <laughs> I got a job in the public service being in Canberra who, they, they were really good. They gave me, um, I kept getting promoted um, on account that I was good at playing cricket <laughs> and everyone wanted me in their team. So, and they didn't believe I'd leave. I'd just say, I'm, I'm going to leave. I'm going to go to uni. No, no, no. Um, they gave me nine months leave without pay after I'd been there a bit over a year and I just travelled around the world. And then as soon as I had two years to the day, it meant... I could be an independent student at university and university was free, but the government would pay me to go to university. As soon as I caught that off, I went off around the world again and arrived back a week before I started at uni at what was then called Mitchell College in Bathurst. Right, and it's- To do journalism. To do journalism. All right, so you, you do your journalism degree and then you actually become a journalist. Do you go straight yeah, into surprise, it? Surprise, surprise. Surprise, surprise. Because I just, I just like mucking around with the media stuff. So I didn't really have a burning ambition to be a journalist. 
um, unlike, unlike many of my friends. Um, but I, I, by the time I was in my last year at there, I was still doing the coursework, but I sort of, I was making, I made a documentary, like a video documentary up on the bikey riots that were an annual event. And I also, this is kind of hard to believe, but I talked my way into Bathurst Maximum Security Prison and trained, even though I didn't know what I was doing, trained some prisoners to be my camera crew and made a doc video documentary inside the maximum security prison to be shown in Sydney. It was when Tony Vincent was trying to reform the prison system. Um, so it was great. We, we ran the radio station. We did current affairs programs, um, the print students put inserts into the local newspaper and we were completely isolated because there was no internet. Um, phone calls were massively expensive. I remember one time my father wanted to, was trying to get in touch with me, so he sent me a telegram, which I got like a week later. Um, so it was, it was a great environment. Um, but it, what I did do literature there, again, as I'd done in, there was this kind of journalism strand and then, um, so I did literature, I did politics and I did drama. Drama was almost compulsory. Um, and it actually is a really good life skill, particularly for anyone who's going to be a journalism to learn how to act, particularly as I ended up being a t television journalism. I did at that stage kind of like creative writing. Um, I had some wonderful literature teachers. My, um, my writing teacher uh, was a bloke called Peter Temple who could be quite a scoriating. So this is before he'd written any fiction or had any fiction published. So he was teaching us like magazine, newspaper, feature writing. So not basic news writing. And I mean, he was, he was at the, simultaneously completely and utterly charming. You saw him at the bar, you know, have a great talk and, and whatever. Um, he had an interesting past um, of, in South Africa uh, during the apartheid era, um, but he was this great writing stylist. So later on, when his Jack Irish books started to be published, I started reading them because I knew him and I, and I admired him. And uh, I'd read other crime books. I'd read, um, I'd always loved the sort of Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler sort of noir, you know, the books that, you know, when they're made into movies, always had Humphrey Bogart in the, in the starring role. And um, and there was some other Australian international crime too, but I but I think it, because of and then of course Peter's final two books, The Broken Show and Truth, are just outstanding. They kind of transcend the crime genre, you know, to the extent that Truth won the Miles Franklin Literary Award, um, and he I guess demonstrated that you can do a lot more with a crime book than just a kind of a mechanical whodunit. And of course, he was the first Australian to win the Crime Writers Association Award for the best crime. Yeah, and so three Australians have run the UK Crime Association's Gold Dagger. Michael Robotham just won it for a second time. I would make the point that Peter Temple, Jane Harper and Michael Robotham all former journalists. Yep, yep. So, kids, <laughs> if you want to be a crime writer, obviously one route might be through journalism. Michael Connolly, the, um, the great American crime writer, um, decided he wanted to be a crime fiction author um, after reading Raymond Chandler at uni and deliberately became a journalist as a route to become a crime writer, which is, I mean, gee, I couldn't think past next weekend when I was, you know, at uni, but there you go. So for how long were you a practicing journalist? Because we're going to come to the river. It, I want the story to come up to your book, The River, which started out as a, which is a, well, it's a documentary in a sense, isn't it, of a, of a certain moment. But tell us what led up to that. 
Okay, so I started, I left Bathurst, I got a cadetship working for Channel 7 in Canberra, the local TV station. Um, within about two years, I was working in a federal press gallery um, in the old Parliament House, which was a wonderful experience. Um, had lots of fun, lots of freedom. Then moved to Sydney, worked at SBS pretty much for the next 17 years. And I, I spent a couple of years as running this sort of supervising producer of a show called Tonight with Paul Murphy, the great ABC SBS journalist who died just the week before last, very sadly. Um, had a great time there. Then went back to Canberra as the kind of current affairs correspondent for SBS TV, so not the nightly news, more, more like more like 7.30, something like that, being the political reporter there. Then I came back to Sydney, based in Sydney, but travelled the world for about four years, sort of going off for a month, filming a whole lot of stuff, coming back. Um, then... Um, my wife and I had a baby. Um, we wanted to try for another one. So I went, I went back and did three years doing news. I hadn't done, done news for about 10 years. And my really short attention span seems to have grown. Um, so, I was, so I was saying yesterday how I just didn't have the attention span when I was in my 20s to think about a book. Daily journalism really suited me. By the time I'm in the 30s, daily journalism wasn't so great. Then we, um, I ended up going back to Dateline and travelling the world again for another four years or so, filming my own material. Uh, really loved it, but really demanding, but very, very hard, particularly on my wife, who was spending long periods at home with two young kids. And then she started travelling a lot for her work. So then I got a job as a chief political correspondent for the Bulletin magazine back in the press gallery in Canberra. And that was perfect because it wasn't daily journalism. I could run my own race, had lots of resources. Fantastic job, lasted about a year. And then they shut the magazine. You know, it had been going for 128 years and they waited till I was working there to shut it down. Um, I was lucky I was offered a job at the ABC and I was offered a job at The Age. And I'd never worked for a daily, uh, newspaper. So I went and worked uh, for The Age as a, a senior political writer. But my two main areas were uh, national security and the environment. So this is about 2008. And the two big environmental issues of that year were um, uh, climate change and the Murray-Darling Basin. So <laughs> has it, haven't things changed in the interceding 12 years? Um, the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, Labor, the newly elected Rudd government, was trying to get the plan through the states um, after John Howard and his environment minister, Malcolm Turnbull, had failed, despite offering the states $10 billion. But the arguments were really between interest groups. It was all about really quite arcane arguments about water licenses and allocations and diversions and it was kind of impenetrable so and i didn't like the daily journalism um so i was this is not this is not a good story actually to tell aspiring writers but i'll, I'll tell it anyway my friend paul daly who, who writes for the guardian now um he decided once the bulletin folded we shared an office he tried writing a book which he, he wrote a he wrote a couple and he said and I was expressing that you know my was unsatisfied at the age and he said oh we should speak to Louise Adler about writing a book so Louise was a publisher at Melbourne University Press and he said she's a big admirer of yours she she's judged some journalism awards some political journalism awards that I'd been a kind of finalist in and anyway, I saw her at, she was in Canberra launching Peter Costello's memoirs. And I went up to her and said, oh, I'd like to write a book. And she just went, oh, yeah, fantastic, sit down. So I was hoping she'd say, yes, email me the pitch. And said, sit down, how about this much money and this, and can you get it done by, you know, whenever, whenever the deadline? I was going, 
yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. She goes, great then. Oh yeah, and what do you want to write about? <laughs> and what I wanted to write is the river, which is travel writing essentially, but travel writing with a purpose. I always loved travel writing. So Bruce Chapman, Jonathan Raban, people like that. One problem with travel writing though, is it's often a bit pointless. You know, you start at A, you finish at B and you tell a lot of funny stories along the way and anecdotes what happened. But so I thought I'd do that, but with a point to find out what was really happening in the Murray-Darling Basin. So this is the height of the millennial drought. And um, what started looking at just the environment ended up looking at the communities, the culture, the indigenous history, the meaning of the bush for Australia. Uh, loved writing it. Spent a week at the heart of a drought in an irrigation town on the Hay Plain uh, where the river had run dry. I mean, technically the river had been turned off. So um, to, in, a, in a really desperate bid to stop Adelaide running out of drinking water, I mean, it was within months of that whole city not having uh, drinking water. Um, and that's where the setting for Scrublands came from. So when I, moving forward sometime, um, when I decided to write, try writing crime fiction, I already had that setting in mind because you know, desperate people do desperate things in desperate times, right? So, so that was it. So I wrote, I wrote the the river. It was it, it won ACT Book of the Year. It was shortlisted for the Walkley Book Award. Uh, it was well received. It sold nothing. You know, it didn't even get into some bookstores. And so I learned, I th learned three lessons about writing. One, I actually liked writing. So I think I'd always liked the idea of being a writer, like who wouldn't want to be a writer and have nice books. And, but you know, the actual work of writing is you know, maybe not so appealing. I found I liked it. I found I could do it. And I found that there was no money in writing books in Australia, right? And, and, the, and the statistic is something like for published authors, their annual income is about twelve or thirteen thousand dollars a year, right? And that was that was probably I might, I might have done a little bit better. Louise was generous with her advances, but I never earned the advances out. And so, after a couple of years of doing that and freelancing or whatever, um, I think you know my wife <laughs> had enough. Of fair enough. Um, so. Fairfax that had very generously given me a redundancy in the first place, then even more generously gave me a job back uh, for the Sydney Morning Herald and the Age back in the press gallery again. But this time around, I was doing, I was, I was running a video production team. Um, and so I wasn't writing nearly as much and I missed writing. So that's, I started writing Scrublands because I liked writing and I thought, I can write well enough to get a book published, but I never thought that I could make a living out of it. It's just something you know I like I like doing, which is, in retrospect, was really beneficial. It meant that I, I was just writing a book that I felt was good. I wasn't trying to impress a publisher. I wasn't trying to write a bestseller. So I wasn't trying to, you know follow any formula or anything like that and then um and then i got sacked <laughs> um they just closed all the video production so, so the city morning herald today has probably got 20 25 percent of the journalists that it had say 15 or 20 years ago these I mean, it's amazing what a fantastic job it and the age still do despite how how much their advertising revenue has been cannibalised by particularly Google and, and Facebook. Um, so I then had a meteoric career as a political advisor that lasted three weeks. <laughs> and then I quit. And the reason I quit is uh, I'd gotten a, an agent, uh, Grace Heifetz, who then managed to secure the most amazing book deal with Alan and Unwin here, and then shortly after with publishers around the world. And so without even really attempting, you know, not 
having the objective of being able to become a full-time writer, I did. Yeah, and then you won the CWA Dagger Award. Or what was the what was the time frame from from the book being published to that to that particular win? Because I, I want to ask about the impact of that kind of recognition for an Australian writer. So, I would have the book the the book deal, the big book offer, um, came at about seven twenty eight on a Friday evening, the 28th of July, <laughs> 2017. So you can see how it's burnt itself <laughs> into my brain. Um, although in the end, it wasn't the book deal that we went with. It's another story. The then Scrublands was published about a year later. Uh -huh. So there was a lot of editing and, and whatever, by which time we had book deals internationally and it had been option for television and all that. So all before it was published, so it was published late July 2018, so about two years ago. And then it was published in the UK and the US in the next January, so January last year, in hardback. Um, and then so came out in the UK 2019. And then three things really helped me in the UK. Well, the first one is had a very good agent there and a fantastic publisher, okay, put a lot of effort into, into promoting Scrublands, which is difficult to do without having the author there. So here you would typically do, you know, festivals like this. You go to bookstores, you meet the booksellers, and there's a whole publicity and marketing and sales team, whatever, that, that uses you. So they didn't have any of that, but the three things that really helped was the Sunday Times initially uh, named it as their crime book of the month and later the crime book of the year, uh, which is which is kind of huge. The second thing is I was invited, the publishers got wind that I might be invited to Harrogate, which is this huge crime fiction festival in Yorkshire, and that Val McDermott every year picks four authors it's a new blood panel um, and it's quite amazing. It's, it's, it's a one stream festival, which means there's just one hall and the authors come and go, but there's six or 700 people in this hall and they all read the books in advance. So when I, the year I was there, so this is last year, seems, seems a long time ago, um, James Patterson was there, Yo Nesbo was there, Ian Rankin was there. Our panel, sell, our event sold out before any of theirs because these are really rusted on crime aficionados and they're desperate for the, to find out who the next, you know, the, the, the new things are, right? And the publishers, when I said, look, if, if you get, if, if she wants me there, I'm going to go. And so they, so I did, I paid my own way, but then they put, they put, they had a little tour for me. So I had a night in Edinburgh, um, but instead of Sue interviewing me, it was Val McDermott. And then the next night I was in Newcastle on a two person panel with Anne Cleese, you know, the author of Shetland and Vera and whatever. So suddenly it was like, holy cow, this is, this is pretty amazing. And then the third thing that happened a few months later in October um, is that I won, it's called the John Creasy New Blood Dagger. Um, and I think I'm the only Australian to have won it. There's a couple of Australian, there's another one that's called the Debut Dagger, which is for an unpublished manuscript that Mark Brandy won and a, maybe one or two others. And then there's the Gold Dagger, which is the one that Jane Harper and Peter Temple and Michael Robotham did. But through those three things, it meant that critics and booksellers went, oh, maybe I need to be across this book. So they read it. So that's all of, it's like all the stars aligned. Um, the US on the other hand was a complete car crash. So, which, which I can talk about if you like, but it demonstrated to me, it's not just the merit or appeal of your book. Mm. A whole lot of other things have to align. And I'm really fortunate in that they really aligned here 
in Australia for me and really aligned in the UK. And I think what you've just been describing is, I mean, I, um, I've been to the BoucherCon, which is a big American festival. They actually held it in Nottingham um, in the 19... In the 1990s, and Val McDermott invited me to, to go, and James Elroy was there, and James Elroy fed me cheese on a stick, and you know, there was all sorts of weird things, but it's where you rub shoulders, and it's huge. We don't have anything bad, Sydney is what you get in Australia, you know. We're we're doing pretty well to have got this festival up and to be in our fourth year, and we're hoping that this will continue to grow. Yeah, I would in that I, sense. I was invited to Bouchercon this year, but of course it's <laughs> I don't, even, I don't think it was on or it was on virtually or mm. something like that. Mm. Um, yeah. Anyway, we need to get into the books. Yeah. Um, because Scrublands, okay, you've set it up. You've set up the background research that you had. And of course, your central character, Martin Scarston, is a journalist. And of course, there's the inevitable question, is there not, of how much of you is there in... Um, Scarston, which is, of course, the sort of question that, you know, Ian Fleming created James Bond as a kind of um, alter, mythic alter ego that everything that he wished he could be and wasn't. What's your relationship with Martin? Well, it's certainly, it's certainly not that. I mean, it is interesting. I mentioned all these former journalists who have become, you know, spectacular crime writers. The interesting thing about the three I mentioned is none of them have journalists for their protagonists, whereas I think a journalist is a good protagonist because a journalist has a license to stick your nose in where it's not yeah. wanted and to ask questions. So it can be a little bit more complicated. You can't arrest people. You can't readily access forensic information, whatever. Um, Martin isn't someone actually who I would aspire to be because he's damaged. So there's a bit of him, the way he, he'll, he'll go after a story and some of the methodologies and things like that. Okay, that's based on my own experience, of course. He's more based, he's not based on anyone in particular, but when I was sort of wandering around as a foreign correspondent, um, I wasn't a war correspondent as such, which people for some reason often think you are if you say sort of foreign correspondent. But there were times when I went to sort of some fairly hairy places, I guess. There's an incident... Um, in scrublands, you know, Martin uh, happens in the Gaza Strip. So I do put in the Gaza Strip because I'd reported from the Gaza Strip, right? That's sort of obvious. But I met these people who, if they weren't messed up on the way into the war zones, they were by the time they got out. I mean, post-traumatic stress, um, self-medicating. I remember running into these guys in... Um, who I'd met in Bosnia, but then later met in Cambodia, and these young guys, and they were camera operators and photographers who were being sent out to get the bang bang, as they called it, and they were shaking. And the only way they could stop shaking, it's like shaking is not a good <laughs> characteristic to have if you're a photographer or a camera operator. The only way they'd stop is by drinking. So it was a combination of probably delirium tremors and, um, you know, PTSD. So I but I deliberately didn't make Martin a boozer because, and, and you kind of find out why, why in silver that he's not a boozer. But I also thought just from the word go to be too much of a cliche, you know, a, a boozy journal, yeah, as if that would ever happen. So Scrublands, of course, you, you, you've written this book your deal wasn't a three-book deal, was it? Uh, it was a two-book deal right. here and a two-book deal in the UK. So you had to write a follow-up? Uh, no. I, well, I had to write another book. Uh -huh. uh, the Alan and Owen contract was simply for a second book. The UK contract was for a second Martin Scarston book. But that was fine because by then I was already... I was... By the time I'd finished Scrublands, I had the ideas per percolating around for Silver. So right at the end of, of Scrublands, Martin is standing on the bridge over the parched riverbed, the empty river. It's the same bridge he stopped at when he, it, right at the start of the book. And it says that any he, he sheds a tear and, and it says 
that it's the first time he's cried since he was eight years old. And that's because I already had the, the genesis of the idea for Silver, which was to take him back to his hometown. And we discover what happened to him when he was eight years old that, that really did traumatise him um, and helped explain why he was he so damaged at the start of Scrublands. And then part of the joy of writing the three books is his own sort of emotional journey and his growth as he becomes more self-aware um, and, you know, discovers love and relationship. Because by the time Scrubland starts, he's 41 and he still hasn't had a kind of mature relationship because he's emotionally kind of crippled. I, I was very excited when I opened Silver because, as you would probably know, how many people here have read Silver? Just out of the... Right. Um, the map at the beginning, when you opened it and you saw the map, did we love the map? We loved the map, even though it was a fictional map. And I actually live, of course, on the south coast, Wollongong, and I live three quarters of the way up the escarpment, but it's only seven minutes to the ocean. But I'm looking at this map and I'm thinking, it's good. it could be, it could be. So where did this fictional place come from, the silver? Okay, so um, after I wrote The River, uh, where I got the idea for the setting for, um, for Scrublands, I, I wrote a companion book called The Coast, where I travelled all the way down the east coast of Australia. So that was the seed of the idea. Um, and I thought it would be a good location for Martin's hometown and then... I thought just as the setting in Scrublands helps inform the mood of the book and the way I write it, but importantly, it, it helps explain the motivations of some of the people there. You know, what I was saying before, you know, desperate times, irrigation town, no water. I see the coast could be good and, and, it, and it could provide a whole different set of uh, motivations. And I was thinking, you know, there could be battles over the environment, which is pretty much in every town along the coast, the push on one hand to preserve native forests and wetlands and the push on the other hand for development. I initially, it's a, so as I said, I live in Canberra, so I'm much more familiar with the south coast of New South Wales, but I just didn't think it was credible to make a town down there, you know, the next big boom town because they're too far away. So there's some beautiful towns down there like Bermagui that would actually be a good setting. But I thought, no, it's got to be, it's going to be the next kind of Noosa, Byron Bay sort of thing. It has to be up there. So I shifted it up there somewhere. Although Sue is right, the escarpment is actually much more like the Illawarra. So it, it's set in a real landscape up there and there's cane fields and whatever. But the escarpment is really taken from somewhere, you know, down south. Um, <laughs> and, and yeah, so that's that's silver explained. And the and the maps, all all crime writers are going to have background information, particularly a timeline, where all their characters are. So, for example, you, you got to know that the murder app had enough time between the last time you saw them in the book to go away, kill whoever they killed, dispose of the body, get rid of the evidence and then reappear again, okay? So all crime writers are going to have all these background documents. In Scrublands, because it's a fictional town, because the real towns out there are much too spread out because there's so much land, you know, so you might have four vacant blocks between buildings and stuff like that. I wanted to make, I wanted to keep it accurate and consistent. Remember, I'm writing it in my spare time over a number of years. That, you know, if Martin walks between the motel and the services club um, in chapter one and it takes 10 minutes and it's half a kilometre, that it's not, you know, three kilometres and 20 minutes and the other side of the road or something. But I put it in the, um, gave it with the manuscript to the agent and the publisher. And in a conversation with the publisher, we said, well, why don't we do this map? Um, and so we commissioned a cartographer to do this map and I just came back and it looked, because for a cartographer, accuracy is everything, right? But it's a made up place. So, so they, they just 
book plan. So we went, let's go with an illustrator. And Jane found this fantastic guy, Alexander Potochnik or, or Alex, who'd only recently arrived back in Melbourne. He'd been there for a year as a student 25 years ago from Slovenia. Um, and all these illustrations, they were beautiful, but they were the little villages in the Balkans and Dubrovnik and places like that. He'd never actually been to a town at that far west. So I had to send him all the photos of all these things because just like Martin does in Scrublands, I, uh, when I was doing the river and the coast, I just take photographs of everything as a kind of aid memoir. So I had thousands and thousands of photos that I could send him. And then we did the same for silver. And the map there, I was drawing the map because it's important. Some of the distances and relations was, are important to the plot. For example, Hummingbird Beach is out of telephone range. And so every time Martin drives back into town, sure enough, his phone pings again and there's, there's some advance in the plot. This time we, 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 so this book, Trust, again has a map, a fantastic map. It's set in Sydney. Um, so I didn't want to have a try and make up a fictional city. Um, but the map, but again, the plot takes part, place over, over a constrained amount of time, about a week and in a very constrained part of Sydney. So it's all sort of Surrey Hills, Ultimo Surrey Hills and some of the Eastern suburbs. So there's nothing on the North Shore. There's nothing um, really even in the inner west or the Shire. There's, it's not tourist Sydney. There's no Harbour Bridge. There's not the Harbour. There's not the Bondi Beach sort of thing. And again, the map is, is great. So I'm so... I'm so glad it's there. And I think, you know, if I'd written this book first, set in Sydney, we wouldn't even thought, you know, thought about doing a map. I love the map. We, we, I'm just looking at the time and I need to let you know that we should be opening for questions. I'm going to ask one more question and then invite our Zoom audience and you in the room to, um, to ask Chris a question. I wanted to come to trust because um, I've reviewed it. You can probably find my review on the um, Fairfax site. And one of the things that I noted about Trust, and if you've read the two other books, is that Trust is where Martin's partner, Mandalay Blonde, there's a whole other thing about names in Chris's books, but um, the wonderfully named Mandalay Blonde finally gets her own point of view. How did that come around? What, what shifted for you between the first book and this book? Okay, uh, Sue's exactly right. The first two books are told exclusively, if you like, from Martin's point of view. Not told in the first person, but very close third person. So he's in every scene and you can read what Martin is thinking, but nobody else, including uh, Mandalay. Um, but in writing Scrublands, what I discovered by the end of it, I, I enjoyed very much that sort of emotional journey of Martin's. So he's changed over the course of Scrublands. And I think that kind of resonated with readers as well. And hence, in Silver, it's all about him discovering and coming to terms with the trauma uh, that impacted upon him and his family when he was a child. And just as um, I got the idea for Silver as I was finishing Scrublands, as I was finishing Silver, I went, but what about Mandy? And we know from Scrublands that she grew up, she had a pretty miserable childhood in the town there, Riversend, and left, left it when she left school and then came back when she was 28, so 10 years later, to care for her dying mother. So I thought, what happened in those 10 years? And it occurred to me, given that her, the, her awful childhood, she's really unlikely to run away from one small, obscure town to another, you know, 18, 19, in her 20s, she's going to be in a city. So that's why the book ended up in Sydney. And that then led to what sort of crimes would be in Sydney. So there's, there's high-level corruption and there's, there's casinos and there's land grabs and there's crooked cops and there's, you know, money laundering and all of that. Um, so, like, Sydney's the perfect place for that, right? But I also realised... If it was going to look at Mandy and her emotional 
journey, if you like. Um, and in the book, her, her past comes back and to bite her big time. She's been in a kind of denial. She's trying to keep it buried. She hasn't told Martin about it, thinking that it's safely in the past. And that, hence the title trust. She hasn't trusted him enough to tell him. He then thinks, well, can I trust her now, given she hasn't told me all of this sort of stuff? I mean, how do I tell his story? I, and I thought, well, Martin can't tell Mandy's story because even though he can be quite perceptive at times, you know, when it comes to criminal matters, he's emotionally not that perceptive. And so I thought of flipping it and telling it entirely from Mandy's point of view. But in the end, for, for various reasons, I decided I'd alternate points of view. And it's pretty much throughout the book, it alternates chapter for chapter. Martin and Mandy, then Martin and Mandy. Um, so you get the dual points of view and you get the sort of them wondering about whether they can trust each other, but also whether can they trust the media, the cops, everybody else. Um, and kind of unintended consequence of it is it makes the book pacier because you can't really, I mean, you could technically, but you could tell a whole day from Martin's point of view and then what go to Mandy and go back to the start of the day. Now, there might be certain sort of books where you would want to do that deliberately, but not this one. So there's more chapters, they're shorter, and it makes the, it makes the book pacier. I would agree. It really is a pacey book. How many of you have read it already? Oh, yeah, we've got a few there. Um, so we're, we're open for questions. Um, do we have any from the floor? If you do ask a question, I will repeat it for the Zoom audience. But does anybody got a, a question they would like to ask Martin? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> Where did the name Mandalay Blonde come from? Yes. I really don't know. I, I, I think I was just thinking of a name based on a place. She starts, so this is the sort of growth that she's been through. Initially, uh, as I was starting to write Scrublands, I thought, well, look, I'll, ha I'll, I'll have a bit of fun with this. I thought... I'll try, and, I'll try and make it multiple crimes. So just when people think they know what's going on, another crime will emerge. Okay, that, that was one of the things. A couple of other things was, I thought, oh, the priest. It was a time when the Royal Commission was, was very prominent. I thought people may think that he's a pedophile and there's a few suggestions there with it. And the trope I was trying to play on with her was this is amazingly beautiful young woman in the town. Martin has just rode in to town like a strange, like a Western. Oh, you know, he's going to end up rescuing her from this town. But if you think about it, what actually happens is that she re rescues him. She rescues him emotionally and she rescues him literally from a knife-wielding maniac. Um, the one thing I'd say about Mandalay Blonde is I got a message a couple of months ago from a guy in lockdown in the UK who was getting his punk band back together and wondered if it would be all right if he named the band Mandalay Blonde. <laughs> and I said, absolutely, as long as, you know, I, you know, you send me your first record. Anyway, he, he sent me some of his, um, you know, his homemade recordings and they're pretty good. <laughs> so, so if you ever see a band called Mandalay Blonde, it is we'll, not a coincidence. It is not a coincidence. You see, the other names, we've got Zelda Forshaw, Clarity Sparks, Morris Montefiore, Darcy Defoe. This is in um, the current book, Trust. And um, Don Winslow was, was talking and he was saying, you can do a lot of things with names in crime fiction. You know, you can set your characters up with their names. I just think you are having fun with names. Well, that's how, it's, that's how it started in Scrublands. Because as I said, my intention was I'd, I'll write a book and it'll be, I'll get it published. And, you know, my mates will turn up, we'll have a little launch, slap me on the back, have a few drinks, and there'll be on the bookcase and that'll be it. So it, it, it wasn't some sort of deliberate device that I thought of this is going to go over well with readers or something. I just started doing it, I think probably when I was a bit bored. <laughs> and then Scrubland comes out and it's doing well. And 
I'm getting more and more kind of sheepish about these, <laughs> uh, you know, Dickensian type names until it had been a bit like this. A woman came out and said, oh, I just love the names in your book. Uh, you know, the ship should be saying yes, thank you. And she said, no, you've got a lot of plot twists. You've got different plot lines going on. You've got like three or four or five plot lines. And she said, because the names are so distinctive, I remember who is, you know, who's who, and I don't have to go back and reread who's that and who's that. And I'm like that when I read books, particularly, you know, if you've put it down for a week or there's a character that hasn't been there for 100 pages or something, if all the names are very Tom, Dick and Harry... <laughs> So I thought, you know what, she's, that, that has a point to it. So then when I wrote Silver and, and Trust, I thought, no, I'll, look, I'll, I'll, I'll stick with this. And many of the characters, of course, um, for those who haven't read it, there are reoccurring characters. Many of the police, um, Klaus Vandenbroek and Morris Montefiore and Ivan Lukic are back, some of the journalists are back. Um, Bethany Glass and, and Darcy Defoe and Doug Funkleton, um, uh, um, Martin's editor, Max Fuller's back, um, uh, Mandy's fierce solicitor, Winifred Barbican is back. So if, if they're all coming back and all the new characters had really bland names, that wouldn't work either if you think about it. So I thought rather than try and water it down, I thought, oh, well, no, I'll lean into it and, you know, make the most of it. Okay. okay. Do we have another question? Yes, we do. <laughs> the question is, how much of the, of the work is a grind and how much of it is an inspiration? You just have flow. It's... There often are... Um, days of grind. I, look, I think any writer is going to have that. I write pretty much every day, and a lot of aspiring writers, I think, oh, well, that shows fantastic self discipline. It's not really, it's more like I'm addicted to it. I, um, and, you know, I, I do know that at the end of the day, I will have a book and it will get published. I mean, that helps, obviously. Um, there are days. I don't use word counts. Um, some days I'll just be staring at the screen uh, because there's a problem, you know, it's a problem with the plot typically. I'm not sure where quite what, something's not working and maybe I'll down tools and go for a walk or a bike ride or a swim or something. Um, then other days, uh, few and far between unfortunately, when it does just flow out of you and it's almost like you know, you're channeling it, you're taking dictation and it's, you can't wait to get back to it to find out what happens next sort of thing. So it's almost like reading as, a, as opposed to writing. But I would lie <laughs> if I was to say that's what it's like most days. No, no, no it's a and, bit tricky. And there are, the editing process can be a grind because you're going back over the same words over and over again. So there's usually three steps. There's a structural edit then there's a copy edit and then there's, there's proof edit. So you might be going back over it six or seven times. That, that can be a grind, but on the other hand, it's enormously important. And you know, I'm fortunate I work with some of the best editors in Australia, you know, people who typically work on, on some of Australia's, with some of Australia's finest literary writers. So, you know, and their whole objective is to make my book better so how stupid would I have to be not to make the most of it, even if there are times when it is quite tedious? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do we have another question? I've got one last question for you, which is you, you mentioned that, you know, you've carried characters over. And I remember interviewing Peter Temple a long, quite a long time ago, and we'd done a count of how many continuing characters he had in... Um, the Jack Irish series, and it was something like he had 42 characters that he was carrying forward from one book to another. And when we presented that to him, he said, that is, oh, I don't think I can write another one. I, it's exhausting carrying that many characters over. Now, this is about a question about seriality. Are you carrying forward with Martin? Are you carrying the characters forward? Are we going to see another Martin Scarston? Look, I, I think there, I have seen some publicity that says that this is the final book 
Um, I'm not, yeah, I, know, I don't know where that came from. But the problem with carrying Martin and Mandy forward is that emotional part of the story. If they simply became kind of hands-off mechanistic crime solvers, there's plenty of books like that and there's nothing wrong with books like that. It's just that readers having been used to one sort of story. So I need to, I need to develop something that's going to be compelling. The, the crime plots are easy enough in some ways to come up with ideas, but that sort of emotional, what, what's, what's changing emotionally. So I think they will be back. But in the meantime, what I'm thinking of, and this, this goes very much to the continuing character thing, I'm thinking of writing a book that is in the same universe, if you like, so, and what I mean by that is contemporary Australia, but with many of those continuing characters continuing on in such a way that one or two might become the point of view characters that we're following that are taking us through the story. And maybe even Martin and Mandy pop up, but not as point of view characters. Mm -hmm. And the, I always liked this concept um, from the Tintin books, you know, you get different people. I, I used to love them as, as, as kids. Um, but the person who does it best probably, um, uh, I'm sure Sue, Sue would know of many more examples than me, but Michael Conley. Mm -hmm. So he's got, he's got these three main protagonists. Harry Bosch is, is the most prominent of them, either a police officer or a former police officer. Um, there's a lawyer called Mickey Haller who's in The Lincoln Lawyer. And there's a, there's a journo called Jack McAvoy. And some of the books are told, you know, Mickey Haller is the point of view character and Jack McAvoy is. But the others may appear in a chapter or two. I've just, I've just read his, his new book called Law of Innocence, which is a Mickey Haller book, but Bosch is in it, but not as a point of view character. I kind of quite like that idea of... of so. So I think those characters continuing forward, um, I don't see it as a burden. Um, I think, you know, they've all got interesting tales to tell. I love, so we've now got the Hammerverse coming. Um, we had the Dishiverse yesterday, but now we've got the Hammerverse. I'm very excited about that. And I can't wait for the next book and to discover who is going to be the central yeah, character. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Fantastic. So we're going to wrap up now. Chris will be walking over the road to around the corner to sign books. If you're watching on Zoom, you can publish the books via um, the State Library Bookshop. Go online, follow the, uh, the, the links to shop, books and gifts, product tags and bad 2020 and the books will all be there. Um, I want to thank you all for coming and being such a fantastic audience, but please join me in thanking Chris Hammer for a fabulous interview. Thank you very much for, you know, staying around for the last session. I appreciate it very much.